Christmas party When the blues was just a baby And you were looking for some fun You just picked somebody's crib And spread the word to everyone Put a bottle on the table And a tip jar on the floor Before the chatting started sizzling They were knocking at the door House party Gonna play some down home blues House party Better wear some dancing shoes Delta style. Sit back, relax, take off your hat. Gonna be here for a while. Clarksdale House Party, Clarksdale House Party, Clarksdale House Party. Y'all come on in. All right, it's a Clarksdale House Party. Our host Gary Vincent, we want to welcome you to the Clarksdale Soundstage, home of the Clarksdale House Party. And tonight we have Stacy Mitchhart with us. We got Mike Donahue with us. Bill Bowker is here from XRDS and Crush Radio. We also have a special filming of Charlie Musselwhite talking about John Lee Hooker. And the reason I mentioned John Lee Hooker is it's John Lee Hooker's birthday Woo! today. <laughs> One, 100 years of enjoying his music. And they opened up a new wing of the Grammy Museum, is that right? Yeah, the exhibit for John Lee Hooker. John Lee Hooker exhibit opened today, so y'all need to go down to Cleveland and check that out because it's, it's going to be really it's cool. Really amazing. So uh, let me grab my guitar. And this is a pretty new song. Mike and I wrote it together.
That's our brand new song. You got to hear it first, right here. Hogstail House Party. So, Stacy and I have been writing songs together for years. And uh, if you've ever been to Ground Zero and heard his band, he, it's an incredible band. But I like hearing him just sitting around the dining room table picking. Ladies and gentlemen, Stacy Mitchart.
out in radio land. How you doing, people in radio land? <laughs> and the people right here. Yeah. This is uh, my song, Influenced by John Lee Hooker. Yeah. Yeah. Which means you stomp your foot when you play it. You know. You gotta get that sound on, man. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> your glass is down there. <laughs> it could have been dangerous, man. Doctor, come over, baby, put my office in your home. Gonna take care of you. My medicine of booze. Gonna fix what's telling you. Well, you see, you got a headache, you be in both day and night. Let the doctor make a house call, make everything all right. Gonna take care of you. My medicine of booze. Gonna fix what's telling you. Say you got a backache, you can't even tie your shoes. Let the doctor bend you over, I'll cure you with my blues. Gonna take a care of you. My medicine of blues. Gonna fix what's telling you. Well, you say that you got chest pain, you can't even catch your breath. Let the doctor rub them, baby, I ain't lost a patient yet. Gonna take a care of you. My medicine of blues. John Lee Hooker, the groove, and, good, we're gonna talk and a drummer. Okay. Uh, Bill, why don't you get up, sit behind that, uh, sit behind my organ. What? <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it sounded better when I said it to Megan last week, or, uh, but, uh, <laughs> like I said, Bill, standing right there, soon to be Is sitting. Good? Yeah. Right here. Take your pick, either side. We're real happy at XRDS.FM 
Dot FM at 88.1 to be uh, airing this Clarksdale house party uh, at least once a month. We, pretty soon we'll be getting it on our uh, Facebook page as well for video. So all in all, uh, we're real excited to be working, and I'm really glad to meet Stacy. It's the first time I've I had a chance to meet you. Sounding excellent. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you. Now, yeah. Where'd you learn to do this stuff? Now, where are you from originally? Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. I mean, they had a big blues thing going, uh, but you look younger than when the federal, uh, you know, the King Federal records were going on. Yeah, but there was still a lot of live blues going on there. So, I so mean, there was an active blues scene oh, going yeah. on. Yeah, there was a, an active just live music scene in general. A lot of, a lot of acts came out of there, all different genres of music. So, uh, I had a lot to listen to. A lot of places to sneak into and a lot. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So early age, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How early? I uh, started playing when I was nine. Yeah. Whoa. So. Uh, How did that come to be? Uh, you know? It was raining. <laughs> well, that's what I know a lot of inf you know, influential players have used that yeah, influence. Yeah. It was raining. No, I mean, it, I was nine years old. Right? When you're nine years old, all you want to do is like play kickball or basketball or something. And my buddy and I were there. It was raining. We couldn't go outside. We looked for a movie to go see, to see if our moms would take us. And there was this big thing in the paper that said, learn to play guitar. And we're like, that sounds like a good idea. So we, you know, we both ran and asked our parents and they said, sure, no problem. So they took us up, signed it up for lessons. And uh, there was no hesitancy, huh? No, from you folks no, at all? no, my parents were, uh, they were big music fans. Uh, a lot of, they didn't really play too much, but my grandparents had bands and I had an uncle, I had an uncle that I'd, I always was told he was a professional drummer. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, man, my uncle's in the big time playing drums. And then I find out like later on, it was just a bunch of like, you know, American Legion halls and stuff. And I, and then I, was, <laughs> it, and at first I was kind of disappointed. And then I was like, then as the years went by, I'm like, you know, every gig deserves your full attention and your full effort. That's you know? true. Yeah. If you agree to play for yes. a certain amount of money, well. money, you know, you shouldn't complain about it. You should go do the gig and, and enjoy it. And, and cause people paid or they want to come see you so it didn't well, matter was if it was american legion have, or yeah, an arena exactly and yeah. i play everything i've played everything from a grocery store with 30 people to something like this with a few people to yeah. the amsterdam arena in holland in front of forty five thousand and everything yeah. in between so what was your first paying gig uh seven dollars so you realize you're going to make a lot of money oh, in this yeah business. man yeah 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 <laughs> Yeah, I've been looking for women with government jobs that have good health care and, <laughs> you know, no, no, I mean, I'm just kidding. <laughs> my, my, no, no, my, my wife, my wife works for Southwest, so finally I'm getting some good benefits, you know, she, she's a great girl. Southwest get gets us out here from California to Clarksdale yeah. often. We fly, yeah, yeah it's great. a great airline. So, yeah. Uh, hi, Twana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got to say hi or else when I get home. So now you've been in Nashville for a while. What what made that move happen? Um, when I came, I, I did a few different things, was up in Philadelphia for a few years, and uh, came back, put my blues band together in Cincinnati, uh, started building, you know, it, we, we got great crowds. We were playing all the places that blues bands didn't normally play. The rock clubs were hiring us, and the other blues bands in town got, kind of got mad at us because we were making more than they were uh -huh. because we looked at it like, hey, you know, you've got to entertain people. You don't just stand up there and play. You know, you do your thing and, and you give them a reason to come. And so then I started branching out and doing cities within a two, three hour radius. And then after I did that consistently, I said, let's go to the next one. Nashville was four hours away and I had a friend that lived there. I went there, they had a brand new blues club just opened up. I sat in and they called me up and they're like, uh, you know, what what would it take to move down here? And, and so I just, I talked to them about it and it was a house gig. I never thought a house gig would work. And I figured I'd be home three months later, and 21 years later, you know, I'm still in Nashville. It was oh, the right. best move I ever made. Well, the thing is, like you were saying, you were getting more gigs by doing blues and everything. And maybe people, once they saw and the word got out about the you're playing the blues, they went to see you whether they knew it was blues or not, because blues is so infectious musically, and it makes you feel good. It does, you know? but, the, but, you know, the only problem... Uh, is, is a lot of people have a negative connotation to blues. They say you're playing blues and they think that it's like, you know, Lord, I'm going to kill myself music, you know, and, and yeah. you just, oh, it's down. But it's not. It's really, it's uplifting. It's got a lot of energy. And so I tried to take traditional blues and I tried to kind of package it up a little bit. You know, we, we dressed a certain way to kind of give it a little, little flair. You yeah. know, we, I took some of the Atlantic City casino type 
thing with, it, without yeah. making it too, you know, too glitzy, schlocky, you know, yeah. but yeah. Uh, took that and, and used some of that kind of stuff and, and marketed it, you know, came up with a name for the band that was easy to remember, had a logo, got it all out there, and, and uh, it just really seemed to work. And, and so yeah. we, gave people, we gave people a reason to come out. Did you ever see John Lee Hooker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw him, uh, saw him in Philadelphia. Yeah. You know, it was, it was a little later on in his life, but um, it was cool. Yeah. Now, that last tune you just did, was that, um, what was it's it called? It's called Blues Doctor. Um, is that going to be on your new record, or is that No, actually, before? that was on a record I did. Uh, I did two versions of it. My very first CD that I put out, like in 92, um, had a more of a big band horns and version. Mm -hmm. And then I did an all-acoustic CD a few years back. And I, I retitled it Delta Blues Doctor and did it that way. Yeah, right. And uh, kind of got into that. So. That sounds great. Really did. Yeah. Uh, and you have a new record out. Got a brand new one out. And uh, we didn't know what to call it, so we just called it my name. Yeah. And <laughs> it's like, what do you want to call this one? Uh, and uh, label out of England. Put it out. Yeah. And um, it's doing really well. It's opening up some doors for me over there, which is great. And it's an all-acoustic CD. Upright bass, drums, percussionists, and me doing... Resonators, acoustic guitars, cigar box guitars, yeah. stuff like that. It, it's a cool, it's a cool record. And it's where can they find it? Uh, you can go to my website, find it. I know it's on iTunes and What's your uh, Amazon and all yeah. that stuff. Website yeah. is uh, stacymitchart.com. Mitchart has two H's in it, and um, next to each other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mitchart spelled H. -I no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at I'll it. spell it out here, yeah. M-I-T-C-H-H-A-R-T. Yeah, Stacy S T A C. Stacy Mitchell, ladies and yeah. gentlemen. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. <laughs> Thanks, All right. I want to give a shout out to the people that came out from uh, uh, Southern, well, North, uh, it would be Northern California. Santa Rosa, we had a contest. Of people wanted to come out to Clarksdale, and we're taking, we took some. And it's Bill Tompkins, Eileen <laughs> Logan. My friend Mark Berry over there, all loving Clarksdale as we all do. Thank you. Let's go back. It's a Clarksdale house party. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Good. Well, he did a good job interviewing, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. He's not as pretty as Megan, but <laughs> I guess it's all in the eye of the beholder, isn't it, Luvana? Hey, uh, get back up here, guys. Come on, man. What do you think? Are you slacking? <laughs> I get to uh, introduce my buddy, Mike Donahue, to you guys. This guy, I met him years ago. He was managing George Thorogood. He was manager for George Thorogood for 30 years, right? It's a long time to be managing anybody. Well, we knew each other pretty, uh, pretty young, you know, yeah. in our teens. And... Uh, I had a working band at 14, so I knew all the clubs and all the places to go, and he was a little later learning to play, but he used to come out to our place, and we'd jam, and then when he got his chops together, I took him around and got him some gigs. Well, then I moved away for 10 years, and 10 years later, I was back in Delaware, and he, he was blowing up. He had bad to the bone. He was opening for the Stones, and he said, I need somebody I can trust. And I says, well, what's the matter? He says, well, I got a lot of hands in my pocket, but I don't trust anybody. Would you want to come and work for me? Help me sort things out. So I said, yeah, I think it would last a year or two if I was, you know, lucky. I mean, you know, we never really thought that it would go on and on and on. We never made a plan that was more than three or four years. Because we just thought that people would wake up someday and really realize the shtick and then it would be over. <laughs> so, but it just kept going and going. We're very, very fortunate. I have to say I had the best job in the world. If you were to sit down as a kid and, and dream up things that you want to do in your life, I was very, very fortunate to, to do that. Well, it was really professionally run, buddy. You did a good job. Well, I appreciate I, I, that. I was, I, had, I was lucky enough to be able to see that that organization in full swing, and it, it really was something that was... Well, like we a, had a system, you know, and, and it worked it for works. us. It worked. Yeah. Still working for him. There's, yeah, he's still he's out still, there. He just still, released the solo album, his first solo album. He just that you released. begged him to do for years. And I now, tried to get him to do it five years ago. And then uh, well, I got tired of it. I retired. I retired in 13. So. And I live in West Virginia, Greenbrier County, West Virginia, and I build a studio on my farm out there. And, and uh, you're busier than, busier and than you ever nuts. been. And it's nuts. It's <laughs> nuts. You know? 
He's making movies too. He's got he's doing soundtracks for movies and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Stuart Margolin, uh, he uh, moved into Greenbrier County and came to me. And he says he wanted to do all the production in the county if if that was possible. And you know, and I put a band together, of very accomplished musicians, to do the soundtracks, yeah. and uh, and it worked out really well. I'm really happy with it. Yeah, the guy from the Rockford Files, right? Yeah, he was Angel in the Rockford Files. Yeah. But he went on, he was very gifted in, in taking uh, screenplay and turning it into dialogue. And he wound up getting out of TV and uh, he must have written dialogue for 25 movies, maybe. And what happens now, with, you know, everything's changed. We, I don't know if you folks follow the industry, but the bottoms, all the incomes have fell out of the music industry. And the same sort of, sort of things are happening to the movie industry. Instead of having, you know, big studios with big lots and actors on payroll and all that, now what they do is uh, uh, they do it independently. And, um, and, and where you, in this case, what Stewart does, he makes his movie and then takes it to the film festival. And with the idea that somebody like Amazon or Netflix or HBO or somebody will come along and buy it from him. And uh, he's done this about a dozen times and he always manages to put his movie somewhere and it works very well for him, yeah. Good, and he's making them at your place, man. He's making the soundtracks well, at your place, which is yeah. a really good thing. Yeah, it's a good experience. So okay, let's, uh, let's play one of our songs. Well, what are we gonna play? Uh, Mike and I have been writing together for a long time, and uh, it, we were in a hotel um, in Memphis. Memphis and sitting around, and he came up with this idea, and, and uh, we, we, we wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you find yourself four in the morning being thrown out of a bar. You go up to your room and you write this song. Well, once in a while, I get to thinking. I might get more done huh? if I stop drinking, but there ain't no room on the wagon for me. Well, there ain't no kind of you offer your arm. I tried it once, but I didn't last long. Cause there ain't no room on the wagon for me. Well, those AA guys kept stopping by just to try to sign me up. Yeah, the more we talked, the best they thought that they would want me in their club. Hey, that's all right, you know, I don't mind. I'm as happy as a cracker on a boat of July. There ain't no room on the wagon for me. You got any? Whiskey cold, you're getting too old. But there ain't no room on the wagon for me. Well, you only live once, but you die once too. And in between, you ought to do just what you want to do. And there ain't no room on the wagon for me. step program cause I know how it's gonna end first step I take be off that wagon and I'd land right on my head well I love whiskey from Tennessee Canadian to you 
no, I'm not hard to please. There ain't no room on the wagon. Well, I know you think that I'm just bragging, but there ain't no room on the wagon for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's very nice, very kind. Well, now what? I want you to talk about John Lee Hooker. Oh, the hook. I thought maybe you'd do it over there, though, but... Well, it doesn't matter. Well, why don't you stay where you're at and talk to him? Okay. I just don't want to sit next to you when you do it, because I want to... Well, Farragut's first album, he had one, the, a cut go to radio. It really broke things open for him, and it was John Lee Hooker's One Bourbon, One Scotch, and a Beer. And they were playing in around Boston, and there he was on a Boston label in, in Philly. And then they started playing it in Denver and then out on the, uh, the coast, out in the Bay Area, which means that you got those locations and, you know, you build a tour. And, and we were fortunate to have, you know, be able to go across the country. And, uh, and George would play uh, bourbon scotch and a beer, and it became a staple in the show. And um, so... <laughs> You know, like, blues is one thing. A blues record's a hit at 5,000 copies. A rock record's a hit at 500,000 copies. So, so, oh, I think in total, Bourbon Scotch and a Beer was on, I think, nine, maybe ten of George's albums. You know, the, the hits records, and they put it on there. You know how that is. The labels always wanted to generate income off your catalog. So... But uh, anyway, we got a pretty healthy income check, and, and George, any reason to, to get with John Lee, I mean, you know, so we get on a plane, we fly out to San Francisco, John Lee lived in a, a little development outside of uh, about 20 minutes from the airport in San Francisco, and we go, you know, driving up to the house, you know, there it is, a nice house, you know, and he's got a Cadillac parked in the driveway with a chocolate body and a, and a tan roof and a license plate on it that said Boogie One. And so we go inside, and there's like six gals in there, and they're all waiting on him hand and foot, and they're all having a great time. And we start talking, and, and George was a minor league baseball player, and, and him and John Lee, they would spend hours and hours talking about baseball. And it wasn't about music. It was about baseball. Um, so, you know, we had a good time, say goodbye to everybody, and then, you know, go move forward another year, year and a half, and there's another fairly sizable check, and we said, let's go see John Lee. And we went back out again, and this time there was only two girls in the house, and everything was a lot calmer, you know. And I said, John, uh, what happened to all the girls? And he stands up, and he walks across to the living room bay window, and he points across to the students and says, uh, but I bought that house over there for the girls. They was driving me crazy. <laughs> and so... So you look there, and then in the parking lot, the house was identical to his, like cookie cutter. And you look in the driveway there, and there is an El Dorado, just like his, but the colors were reversed. It was tan body and chocolate roof. And the license plate on the back was Boogie 2. <laughs> and uh, he was a real character. Everybody loved him, and he would just do anything for you, you know. I mean, lots of times there would be, you know, I should maybe get into this, but he always had a lot of gals around, and he was always helping them. I mean, the man would give you the shirt off his back if if you told him you needed it, you know. I mean, he was a, everybody loved him, and he was always fun and always cutting up, always cutting up, and it was just so much fun to be around it, you know. We were very, very fortunate to have known uh, John Lee Hooker. Let's play some more music. I'm on a chicken kick, man. It's an, there's another chicken song. <laughs> you guys are getting to uh, hear all kinds of new stuff here.
chicken can be beat. Good from the beat down to the bony little feet. But my job moved to Mexico, my money's all gone. That's why I'm singing this chicken this song. Ain't no chicken, ain't no chicken. Supper's gonna suffer if the clucker is missing. Here I am just crying in the kitchen. Pot full of stock, but there ain't no chicken. Yeah, tastiest burr the Lord ever made. If you ain't in the meat, well, you can still eat the eggs. Dye them up pretty on Easter Sunday. Make a nice egg salad for your lunch on Monday. Ain't no chicken, ain't no chicken. I'd settle for some gizzards or some gravy dripping. It ain't looking promising from where I'm sitting. Right here in a kitchen where there ain't no chicken. Got a yard bird addiction that I have no chance of quitting. Here I am just crying in the kitchen. Pot full of stock, but there ain't no chicken. Ain't no chicken. Ain't no chicken. I got a fork in my hand. It's only wishful sticking. A pot full of stock, but there ain't no chicken. song. Okay, we're going to have Roger get up and talk to us a little bit. How about a hand for Roger? Thank you. For those of you in Radio Land, if you're watching the video later and you're my mother, this is, this is not a Pabst in front of me, it's the mic stand. So I just want to be clear about that. So I'm Roger. I guess we've established that. I have Cathead, the blues store downtown, work on various festivals, sometimes get to take bluesmen overseas. Um, through time, I get to meet a lot of really awesome blues people. Unfortunately, John Lee Hooker was not one of them. Um, I did almost see him right here in Clarksdale, Mississippi in the uh, late 90s, but apparently he was ill and unable to play the festival here. Uh, but his music's always been important to me, and uh, I guess I've lived it, uh, experienced it through other bluesmen who really at the time either knew him or 
heard it on the radio or bought the records. So guys like Big George Brock, who's now 85 and does Boogie Chillin', songs like that. Um, Pat Thomas down in Leland, Mississippi, who learned songs like Dimples from his father, James Son Thomas. Um, and you can see him play that pretty much daily at the Highway 61 Blues Museum in Leland. And then a guy like Robert Wolfman Belfour, uh, who was a guy I used to see all the time at Reds, book him on festivals. And if you had him play long enough, about two and a half hours into his show, he'd hit some John Lee Hooker. You know, he was a Mississippi Hill Country guy from North Mississippi. Uh, so folks think about him as that, but he's a huge John Lee Hooker fan. So uh, fortunately, I was lucky enough to know Mr. Balfour and get to take him places. And one of the first places I believe I took him overseas in 2005 was Italy. Parma, Italy, as in Parmesan cheese, you know, awesome. Except that what he wanted every night was uh, fried fish and French fries, which is not very Italian, was a challenge. Uh, you know, one, one night the fish comes with eyes and everything. He comes out of his seat. And then he sat down and ended up eating the whole thing, except the eyes. Uh, another night, they brought calamari as a side, and he thought they were onion rings. Not very good onion rings, but he thought they were onion rings, so it worked. But we go through this week-long tour, and I had uh, Mr. Belfour and then Lightning Malcolm, if you know who he is. He came to play drums, and then he ended up opening up on the shows. So there's the three of us, and we've done this great week. It's been a blast. We're ready to go in the morning, super early. We tell the lady who doesn't speak any English uh, that we need to be picked up at a certain time at this B&B way out in the countryside. And of course, I speak as much Italian as she spoke English, so uh, apparently there was a communication breakdown. Suddenly, we're awakened out of the blue. The bus is here. We just have to grab our stuff and go. And they're like an hour late or more. And now we're hitting like rush hour traffic. So we get to the airport. Mr. Belfour uh, was elderly and had kind of bad legs, so we had to get him a wheelchair. And there's like this huge line to check in. So we're going to check in. Anybody who knows Lightning Malcolm knows he's just smiling and happy to be there. So I didn't really worry about him. I figured whatever happened, he'll be smiling and happy to be there. So I tried to stay with the old bluesman, got in the wheelchair, crazy mob crowd. I mean, really, it was like a cattle call just trying to check in. And they assigned this young lady, cute young Italian lady who had just started working either for the airport or the airline. I don't know how that works uh, to push Mr. Belfour in the wheelchair because there's no way we're making this flight, but they're going to try. So there were a lot of words exchanged, some of which I think I did understand. Um, but she takes off running with Mr. Belfour, and I'm carrying all the crap, so I'm like running after him with all the crap, mine and his. And she runs off into the bowels of the airport. I mean, like, barely any lights on. It's like, we're in the closed part of the airport. This doesn't seem right. But I'm just running after, all sweaty. Mr. Belfour, of course, is super cool in his suit and hat, just in a wheelchair. And she runs us through, like, all these back areas. It appeared we were going around security, which made me a little nervous. Suddenly, we burst through this door, and there's all these pilots in there smoking and playing, I don't know, poker. I'm not sure what it was. And all of a sudden, they're yelling. Again, I understood some of the words. Uh, she's yelling right back at them, and she gets us through, and we pop out the other side. And there's this little, apparently for VIP, uh, little check thing with the uh, x-ray machine and everything. It was, it was small. And it was just one of them. We get, get up to it. And we're putting our stuff up there and I'm sweaty and I'm like, there is no way we're making this flight. And I look up and right in front of us, here's Mr. Balfour and here's Ernest Borgnine. So <laughs> apparently it's where Ernest Borgnine checks in and Robert Balfour. So I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, he looked just as goofy as on TV in the movies. So we get through that and I'm like, there's just no way we're making this flight. I mean, it's really like at the time. And we walk up and it's like a huge, apparently on the second floor is what it felt like. And there's a huge glass wall of windows. And you look out on the tarmac and there's vehicles and there's airplanes every which away and there's luggage. And I'm like, this doesn't seem like where you get on the airplane because it wasn't. So <laughs> she gets on this phone that just suddenly is on the wall. Like suddenly you notice there's a phone and she picks it up. She's yelling, somebody else is yelling. That went on for a while. Then she hung it up and then like looked at us like everything was fine, just kind of smiling. And uh, suddenly out of this sea of airplanes and luggage and everything out on the tarmac, comes this crazy futuristic Star Wars vehicle, like real low to the ground, but it had this glass box on top. So it comes up and suddenly, unbeknownst to me, some of these windows open up. It's like a sliding door thing. And this guy operates this elevator off the top of this truck and comes up to the second floor and exchanges more words with her, shows her very briefly how to use the stuff in there to make the elevator thing on the vehicle go up and down and do stuff, and then gets off again yelling. 
So we take off. She manages to get us down, you know, you know, down back to the vehicle. And there's a driver down there, but she can only talk to him with a phone that's in the, the glass box. So we drive off. We're going between airplanes, under airplanes, around luggage, like way out. And I'm still thinking, there's no way we're making this flight. And I don't even know if, how do I even know she's taking us to our flight? You know, does she even know at this point what we're doing? So we come up to this airplane. She pulls up to the opposite side of how you normally board, gets on the phone, words are exchanged. Suddenly, the door pops open, the emergency door behind the cockpit. And she makes the thing go up, you know, this elevator thing. Words were exchanged when the door opened because, man, people were pissed, frankly, uh, inside the airplane. But we get in there, they're yelling at her, so we just kind of go in and she goes back off with the vehicle. I'm sweaty. Mr. Belfort looks great. I'm sweaty. Get him situated and suddenly I'm like, oh my God, lighten him Malcolm. He's not in the airplane. <laughs> I'm like, good Lord, I can't lose somebody. So uh, I go up with my most authoritative voice in English, which wasn't helpful, and uh, tried to basically say, we can't leave, we can't shut that door without blah, 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 this musician. I was told to sit back down, um, and that I did understand. And so as I'm going back past the cockpit, past the door they had open, suddenly there's a bus coming out of nowhere, like just going through everything, and there's one goofy guy standing up there holding his guitar, that <laughs> Telecaster in a case. There's Malcolm. Cool as a cucumber, gets on the airplane. So this has nothing to do with John Lee Hooker. However, uh, I say all that to say that the, uh, the way that John Lee Hooker was channeled to me live and in person about three times a month was through Robert Wolfman Belfort at Red's Lounge. He'd be at least two hours into the set, and then he'd tell a little story about, yeah, I learned all this stuff from my dad and from my neighbors, uh, but there were some songs I heard on WDIA late at night. I'd tune into the radio. And I'd hear Boogie Chillin' or Hobo Blues. And he would usually launch into Hobo Blues at that point. And what I loved about it is he took himself back in time and remembered how special that was, how unique it was, um, how there was only one John Lee Hooker, particularly back then when nobody was even copying him or doing his songs at that time. Um, and it helped to inspire him. And those nights to me, that's like as close as I ever got to the man himself. Thank you very much. Now, I know that Charlie Musselwhite isn't here at the moment, but he was here a couple days ago. And he was, uh, he was really bummed that he couldn't stay and do this, the house party. Um, but he did film something for us. So uh, this is Charlie Musselwhite with his, uh, his thoughts. First time I met John Lee was in Chicago. He lived in Detroit, but he would come to Chicago to play. This was a club owned by Big Bill Hill, which I forget the name of. It was on Roosevelt Road, I believe. Anyhow, we uh, hit it off right away. And we just became such good friends. It was like meeting an old friend for the first time like we'd been friends forever. And um, we stayed in touch and stayed for real good friends from then on. And I saw John all around the country. Our paths would cross here and there in different clubs and festivals. We both moved out to California. Uh, I would stay at his home many times. So I'd spend the night. <laughs> It'd get too late to go home or for several other reasons. And uh, John loved to laugh, loved a good joke, loved to, he was like a trickster to pull tricks on people. And he was very generous, had a big heart, loved everybody. I remember the first time I heard John Lee was on the radio. I listened to XERV from Ciudad Acuna, Coahuila, Mexico, or WLAC out of Nashville. 
And they play, uh, I remember hearing like Hobo Blues and Crawling King State. Real late at night, John playing solo, just him and his guitar, just foot tapping. And in the middle of the night, just hearing that sound, it, it just had this real low down, kind of sinister sound. I loved it. I still love it. He was a great uh, individual kind of blues player. Nobody played guitar like John Lee. He had a sound, nobody sounds like that. Even people that play note for note what he plays, you don't get that sound. I don't know how he, how he did that. And uh, John was a huge uh, impression on the blues and you know, boom, boom, and all those hits he had. And I feel real honored to have known him and called him a friend.
Hello. Hey, Robert. Everybody there? Yeah. At Radio Land, you out there? Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to change a little history of John Lee Hooker. After a minimum of eight reference resources, probably the best being Charles Murray's Boogeyman. Uh, Charles Murray is the musician's writer, uh, uh, did an excellent book. But he introduces uh, Tony Hollins, who came into John Lee Hooker's life uh, while courting his sister Alice, uh, gave him an old guitar and taught him Crawling King Snake Blues and Catfish Blues. Later, uh, he, he meets Will Moore with that uh, his mother, Minnie, lives with for a while. And uh, Will Moore teaches him boogie, that boogie-woogie beat that uh, is so classic John Lee Hooker. There are no known recordings of, of Will Moore. John Lee was born to Father Reverend William Hooker Sr., born in 1872, born in North Carolina. His father was from North Carolina, his mother from North Carolina. John Lee's mother, Minnie Ramsey Hooker, born in 1877 in Alabama. Her father, born in Alabama, and mother from, was born in North Carolina. Misquotes of dates start with many. Imagine that, a woman lying about her age. In 1910, she says she's 31 years old. 10 years later, in 1920, Minnie has only aged eight years. She says she's 39. John Lee follows that and quotes years of birth as 1915, 1917, 1920, 1923. In later years, he adamantly says it was 1920. But it was always August 22nd. By 1920, William and Millie, Minnie, live in Tallahatchie County, Mississippi, with only her 11th child, Jesse, yet to be born, and a baby only a month and a half years old. The U.S. Census of 1920, recorded on February the 3rd in Tallahatchie County, shows the seventh child of William and Minnie Hooker, a seven-year-old John, short of his eighth birthday. John Lee Hooker's actual date of birth is August 27th, 1912. Today, August 27th, 2017, John Lee Hooker would be 105 years old. Happy birthday, and that's a fact, Jack. I'm Robert Birdsong, and you heard it first here on Clarksdale House Party on XRDS Radio, Clarksdale's Blues Radio. Okay. We're just jamming at this point. Is that all right? Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Busted. My Porsche's in a shop. I bought 1,100 shares of some dog shit stock. My maid came down with the Hong Kong flu. I got the Lord down up a tax of bracket blues. I got too much money to hide in IRAs. Got a mansion in France, but still I can't get laid. Ain't easy walking around in these Gucci shoes. I got them Lord upper tax bracket blue my thoroughbred keeps losing 
My lawyer's deranged, my wife can't stand me, and my dog's got the mange. My gardener keeps peeing in the swimming pool. Got them lowered down, upper tax of bracket blues. My shrink must think that he's sick, man, Freud says I hate my mother and I'm a paranoid. I got chronic psychosis of the old wazoo. I got them lowered up a tax bracket blue About the money they make I'm gonna hire a bunch of scabs And pay a minimum wage Tell the union of the traders They can lick my boots I got them lowered down Up a tax of bracket blues My secretary Says our sex is trash I'd buy her in a minute But she's got a nice ass She said I look real good In a harassment suit I got them lowered up a tax of bracket blues If money is a curse Lord, I paid my dues I got them lowered down Up a tax of bracket blues That is not a true story So you guys We want to thank you so much For coming to the house party It was This This woo. This was fun. It was fun. It was lovely. Thank you. Yeah. All those people listening in at Radio Land. What's up here? One last announcement. Drinks on Gary. All right. Yay. All drinks. <laughs> yeah. Vincent Productions, the Clarksdale Soundstage, and the Clarksdale House Party would like to thank XRDS.FM for their continued support. We hope that you'll keep on tuning in locally here in Clarksdale on Rocket 88.1 on your FM dial.